Hi, I'm Femi O'K and you're in the stream. Today, will Hollywood ever really properly represent Muslims? It's no secret that stereotypes and tropes have dominated US popular culture for decades. Are times changing though? A lot to discuss today and we want to hear from you, so join our live conversation on YouTube. So what do we have? We have the angry terrorist, the bumbling sheikh, the sultry belly dancer, the good Muslim versus the bad Muslim. So without a doubt, all stereotypes that you've seen in your favorite Hollywood film or television program. According to a new report, Huck and Hollywood, illuminating 100 years of Muslim tropes and how to transform them, this representation has fueled anti-Muslim sentiment and even shaped government policies. Huck is the Arabic and Urdu word for reality. Things are beginning to change, though, on screen, behind the camera, and in the writer's room. So this is Zico Zaki. He's an Egyptian-American currently starring in the CBS drama FBI. He sent the stream his thoughts on being a Muslim-American in Hollywood. It comes down to representation. And in film or television, you're either perpetuating a stereotype or fighting against it. And, you know, as an artist, both things are equally as important when it comes to the work, but of course, fighting these stereotypes is something that we all are excited to get involved in. So I'm very excited and I think that Hollywood is now starting to use Muslims and Arab Americans to tell the stories of the good guys and that's only gonna help us as a nation come closer, hopefully as a world, and we can only do what we can do so if I can make a few people around this world that didn't care for Arab Americans or Muslims before, if they can start to care about them now and just relate and find a friendly face in us and things like that, you know, the minimum effective dose and just to start the conversation and start the ball rolling in the right direction. Um, so I'm hoping to represent us well and you know, that's kind of what drives me every day. So. We'll see how it goes and uh, wish me luck. Good luck. Joining us from Los Angeles is the author of the report, Huck and Hollywood, Maitha Al Hassan. She's a senior fellow at Pop Culture Collab. That's a group pushing to accurately portray the stories and cultural realities of people of color. Salam Al Mariati is the executive director of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Amina Bakir Abdul Jabbar is a filmmaker and professor at California State University. And Azita Ganizada is an actress and advocate. She's also founder of the MENA Arts Advocacy Coalition, an organization built to speak out for Middle Eastern North African performers' rights and visibility. It's good to have you here, everybody. May I, I'm just wondering, Hi. hello, hello, good to see hey. you. I, I'm calling this the new face of Hollywood. Welcome, Hollywood. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, May, I'm just thinking, it, it, it feels to me like a, a no-brainer. Why would you have to write a report about the lack of representation Presentation of Muslim faces or Arab faces on TV and Hollywood movies? Obvious. It, it is obvious when we look at the landscape right now, but I wanted to hit at the heart of how entrenched those images are and the narratives that are fueling them so that we could properly eradicate the consistent place we see ourselves in, which is more and more stories about terrorism, more and more stories about the sheikh and the bumbling fool, more and more stories of women being misrepresented. So this report takes a 100 year history to figure out how we ended up here with policies like the Muslim ban. And it's not just simply a post 9-11 moment of terror genre films. I mean, we saw a whole crop of them in the 1980s and 1970s in response to US foreign policy in the Middle East. And concurrently, as the report goes into, there are, as uh, Amina um, does an amazing job speaking to black Muslims who are portrayed in really um, derogatory ways by mm -hmm. the American public, but black filmmakers fight back with really differing portrayals, um, whole portrayals. And so this long history is essential for us to understand not only how we got here, but how we don't repeat our mistakes. And also, I highlight 
the really interesting work that Muslim creatives are doing in this moment mm. and how they're pushing back against this narrative. And lastly, and there's an interview with Rami Youssef, who has a show on Hulu coming out in the next uh, season, the 2019 season. Mm. But I end with recommendations. So how can we break this cycle? And the report talks about how we find ourselves in this place over and over again sure. and how we can use community members to disrupt it. I have a theory that sometimes people don't even realize that they're seeing a trope or a stereotype. It sort of goes over their head. There was something that you pointed out, which was from Aladdin, a 1992 Disney cartoon, which was yep. a huge, massive hit. It was hilarious in many parts. It was a popular cartoon. But the opening sequence actually has some Islamophobia right embedded in the song, right. the chirpy little right. song. Do you remember a little bit of the song, May? Yeah. I'm not allowed you to sing it, but quote <laughs> it to us. I mean, I think anybody that grew up as a child with that representation, especially if you grew up Arab in America, yeah. you can never forget those lyrics. So in the movie theaters, on giant screens, you heard, um, they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. And so because of the great organizing work that ADC anti-Arab discrimination committee, I mean, anti Arab anti-discrimination committee, apologies, um, the work that they did, also Jack Shaheen, the late media studies scholar, pushing back against what Disney was doing, they mm. did get the lyric to be changed in the VHS release. But now Disney is making a live action remake of that film in 1992. And because of how they've had enough time to look at what that film has done, the damage that it's done, they don't want to repeat those mistakes. Sure. Amina, what are you seeing right now where you're seeing this is not representing me? Well, I think that for me, I'm black, obviously, and um, Muslim, and I think that it goes back to what Malcolm used to talk about, like the original discussion about black or Muslims who were black in America and the definition not even being from uh, Muslims who are black and, uh, you know, being called black Muslims. So there's a way that even when you see representations of black Muslims or Muslims who are black, they are not a part of the whole conversation of Muslims. So we're sort of othered in that. And that is because I think the relationship that um, black people have in this country in terms of um, how we were you know, brought over here in the transatlantic slave trade, sure. even the discussion about Islam in America and how when we think about the slaves in, um, during antebellum South and the idea that there are actually Muslims who are practicing black, Muslims who are black practicing Islam, um, but that is often left out of history books and certainly left out of the discussion of that in uh, cinema. So um, for me, it's about sort of, you know, I take like the idea that the, um, I think about it as redefining what people expect mm -hmm. in terms of what I, it means to be Muslim. And I'm a Muslim who, ha who is black, but who's very American, right? Yeah. So I think about the uh, Muslim ban and how that ban is also a ban of the um, of, of African countries as well, but the face of the Muslim ban doesn't seem to have yeah. that. So, Amina, for, 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 so, Amina, for instance, you're not coming to America to be a terrorist or you're not coming as an immigrant because you live in America and uh, black Islam goes back many, many years. Uh, you, may, you mentioned Malcolm, well, if, Malcolm X. Well, well, it predates even Malcolm X, who, exactly. um, you know, El Haj Malik Shabazz. It, it predates, yeah. you know, it's from the very beginning when black people come to this soil. Mm. And I would argue that, um, you know, we get left out of that conversation and where it's a monolith, right? So we don't think about uh, Muslims who are black as being, we only think of them as being in the Nation of Islam partially sure. uh, or mostly, or we're even left out of the trope discussion because um, we actually can't hold that trope discussion for black bodies and Muslims, I think I do this experiment where I ask people to close their eyes and yeah. I say, black Muslim woman. Yes. And I don't think people are able to hold that, right? So there's yeah. a way when you think of black, you think of usually a man, you think yeah. of like a bad man, a bad black man, right? Sure. And let me, let me help. Let me help people out so a little think, bit. Any, I, any, I also, anybody who watches the stream will, will be able to picture a black Muslim American because my co-host is Malika Bilal. So uh, she yeah, is out yeah. there representing. Salam, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, there's no doubt that Hollywood has been the um, has been guilty 
of both religious and racial stereotypes mm -hmm. uh, of a lot of people. And when it comes to Islam and Muslims, the trope that is usually uh, bandied about is that Islam is a foreign religion. And so whether you are indigenous or immigrant, whether you're African American or Arab American or Pakistani American, I think we're all basically trying to, we're all struggling uh, with these stereotypes. So there are many different paths that we are taking in terms of dealing with these Hollywood tropes. Mm. Well, can and I, can and I... also, uh, there's a great uh, video that was done by, um, by a friend of mine, Michael Singh, called Valentino's Ghost. And it looks yeah. at the public opinion that was manufactured to support and fom uh, foment anti-Muslim and anti-Arab policies in this uh, in this country, so it go it definitely goes you know, back some, at least a hundred years, if not longer. Azita, go. Something that we're, let me just bring in. That Azita, let me just bring in Azita. Azita, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> something you know from a performer, actually, someone who's lived this for fifteen years in the business and uh, navigated not doing those stereotypes and resisting and saying no to jobs that didn't feel right for me. Mm. Um, a big part of what we've achieved in the last few years here in Hollywood that has changed is that you know we are fighting for recognized status because Muslim Americans, which are mainly Middle Eastern, North African, South Asian Americans, we count, were counted as Caucasian in that space in casting categories. So when representation and inclusion became very hip, hmm. I was oftentimes asked if I was ethnic. Yeah. And, what does uh, that mean? You know, what does ethnic mean? <laughs> it means did I check a box? Yeah. So what was happening in the last five years is that the images were continuing to kind of devolve because we were being counted as Caucasian. And they didn't have a place to put us. And so yeah. just in this past August, we have our own category now, which is MENA, Middle Eastern, North African. And so now there's a place for recognized status. So I'm hoping that there's more of an mm. uptick in roles like Zico got, where you can actually have a hero. I mean, Zico's a good looking dude. He could be our next Henry Golding. And we need that kind of representation. And we need more people to realize that with something like Crazy Rich Asians at the box office, that having a diverse cast that isn't just some sort of a, a stereotype trope or a religious storyline that's something mm. that's a human story that everyone sure. can connect to is big at the box office let me just and let me just play let me just play I, I it would be very remiss of me if we do this whole conversation I don't squeeze in the clips so guess just give me a little bit of a pause Asita I want to play a little clip from Alpha uh, Alphas and it has a Mahasha Ali in it as well um, so people can see the kind of roles that you do accept and you will take have a look ask her if she has a boyfriend yet isn't she a little young for you? Excuse me? Never mind. There's someone behind the glass. I wouldn't worry about that. Who's there? I know someone's there. I can hear your heartbeat. Hi, Rachel. It's Eric. Long time. Eric Latro? I know him. We brought him here two years ago. Eric, what are you doing? I'm reading your micro expression. So far, so good. Until you are done, I'm trying to conduct an investigation. More like a witch hunt. It's not a witch hunt if one of you is guilty. And one of you wins. Unless you're wrong. And then you're turning friends into enemies. Is that a threat? That's Azita in a mini series called Alphas. Azita, what were you saying? Say that yeah. one more time. I said, yes, Ali was threatening me. What a beautiful black Muslim man, Mahershala Hashbaz Ali, who's mm. Mahershala Ali now. But so Ali and I had, you know, we got to play two well-rounded characters. Uh, I played somebody who was from, you know, Central Asia and really represented the cultures and everything that went on in Afghanistan and Iran. And we didn't really play into any story, religious storylines. We didn't play into any of the stereotypes, but we represented the culture. Sure. And that's something that I went to the creators and we discussed together. And so there is some responsibility on the performers to engage their storytellers and communicate. And for all of us as a community to connect together and say, yeah, we're not going to do that. We're more than just this religious idea that you're painting on us. Mm. We have rich traditions, rich culture, cultures. We come from 22 different countries in that region of the world. And we represent a multitude of religions. And so to be able to see us as more than just one thing is super important in order to change the perspective. And, you know, we can't just, you know, if African Americans are so lucky because they have they have united. Mm. They have unified each other's voices. They amplify each other's work. Chris Hart, uh, you know, uh, 
Chris Rock is amplifying Kevin Hart's opening movie weekend. And we need to start doing that for one another in all of the spaces by amplifying the studies okay. that are coming. So let me, let me put, let me so share, let me share to... this with you. This comes in live okay. from YouTube uh, by Legendary. And Legendary says, Hollywood makes movies that correlate with money. They are not racist or discriminate. They are just living up to people's stereotypical views of Islam. Discuss, Salam. Yeah, no, it's the other way around. It's, ah. it's, it's the stereotypes that influence public opinion where there is a fear of Islam. And, and I think that's the issue. It dehumanizes Muslims. It dehumanizes people uh, of color. And, and that is a problem, you know, for all of us, not just uh, Muslims uh, and, and Arabs. Um, I, I want to say, though, that our approach in, in terms of dealing with, with, with this problem is engaging uh, those uh, mid-level uh, professionals in the industry. Uh, by consulting. Uh, we also engage TV networks and production companies. We do one-on-ones with, uh, with those industry professionals. We do screenwriting labs. We, we do networking events. And so there are good people in Hollywood. There are a lot of good people. And, mm -hmm. and so our approach is to ally with the good people. Uh, yeah, so we also we're doing don't a... stereotype all that. So yeah, and we're I think doing we're a... all... Go ahead. Tonight we're host. Uh, tomorrow night, actually tonight in New York and tomorrow night in, uh, in in Los Angeles, my coalition is and with the Casting Society of America, we're hosting the first ever town hall between the casting community and Middle Eastern, North African, South uh, Asian communities to talk about the issues that we uh, deal with when we're trying to get cast for a role that isn't necessarily stereotyped to one region of the world. To try to have inspire some balanced storytelling mm -hmm. so that. I can play the same role Carrie Washington plays, and it doesn't have to be about my religion, that it can just be that I'm a powerhouse attorney or whatever that might be. And so we're starting to have these conversations. This is We've gotten the ball rolling in that space. So there is some progress because we're coming in and we're educating, we're inspiring, we're saying, hey, we are we are black Muslims, you know. We are Arab. We are Afghan. We are, some of us are Christians. There's many of us from this region of the world that okay. demand fair representation. All right. So let me go to uh, May first of all, and then Amina. May you go. You okay. go first. Well, um, there there's a triangular relationship. That's what I discussed in the report. It's basically there there are political drivers that affect public opinion. And Hollywood is somewhere responding in between those two things. Now, it's not that they make a lot of money off of this. You saw the whitewashing of gods and whatever that recreation of Moses' story was, that, gods, that film. Gods in Egypt. Gods in Egypt. Uh, bombed at the box office. Nobody wanted to see yeah. white folks continue to play characters from a region where we know there were people of color. And also a TV series called The Brave. I think this idea in this moment, Hollywood um, has this conception that, okay, we're going to move beyond the bad terrorists and give you the good Muslim who is fighting on behalf of the state, who is either a CIA agent or an FBI agent. And we're going to watch them catch the terrorist or catch the other bad guy who is not the Arab or not the black Muslim. And that hasn't panned well either. The show The Brave was canceled after one season. So I passed I think, on that audition. You know, I read that script. Yeah. They asked me to come in on one of the mm -hmm. roles, and I, I read the script, and I said, unless they want me to come and tell them what is so inherently wrong <laughs> with the writing right. here, how damaging well, this is, I'm this not is coming. Not, and this is, yeah, so, this so, is not so, so, yes, let me just bring in Abdullah. Uh, Abdullah Al Nasser is on YouTube, so he's on my laptop here. Increased representation in movies should help Western society further understand Islam. Amina? Well, I want to go back to the comment before. I want to say that that was not to go away from this, but just to make sure I hit that point that mm. um, it's nonsensical to discuss the um, stereotypes as, as being profitable when we know that people are smarter than that. They want good stories. They want authentic stories. And it does us a disservice to accept stereotypes. And there's no more does this become true than with the film Black Panther, right? So I don't think that, you know, when you look at Black Panther, that film, there's no, that's, that's um, a great example of um, a money-making machine and positive representations of blackness. And there's no reason we can't have that with stories about Muslims. Um, I don't think anybody on this panel would disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I just wanted to say that we've, we've estimated that there are at least 800 projects for us to consult on. Now, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're the Impact Hollywood Bureau. We, we have our recommendations that are also pretty much in line with May Hassan's report um, that you can find uh, through our op-eds. 
we do 15 of these projects right now, but there's more than enough work for all of us to get in there so that we can move the needle uh, on these stereotypes. And, and I think um, I, really I don't wanna, everybody should be involved. I don't want to move the needle as a consultant. I'm a filmmaker and a director and a, and a writer and a producer. So my, my av what I want to put up as activism is when you all are contacted to be um, consultants on this, that you ask who is Muslim in the um, above the line positions, right? So the writing, the producing, the directing, you know? And so for yeah. me, it's like, I'm a content creator, I'm a director, I've been in the, doing this for over, you know, since for years, since 2002 at least. So I think some of that is when they come to you all, you know, push them to hire Muslim mm -hmm. <laughs> above the line that's, people. Well, right, that's exactly right, yeah. what so we do, that, and we, we'll, we'll do it, we'll, 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 right, we'll don't, do a better that's, job. That's, that's me, that's, that's me. That's, that's another part of the conversation, which I am a little newer to this world uh, in terms of working within the industry. I've studied film for and representations of Muslims for years. And so it was illuminating to realize that the work of consultants sometimes takes away the seat from the writer in the room. But there are larger structural problems in Hollywood mm -hmm. where in how a writer person of color or somebody who is traditionally underrepresented in the writer's room enters a room and usually is the token person um, is doesn't have any other allies in the room, or sometimes a showrunner or producer will say, I have a consultant, so I don't need a writer. So I, I take your point very strongly, Amina. Um, and I also point to the other kind of interesting activism that's happening with Muslim creators. You know, we have our actors, we have our writers, but there mm -hmm. are folks who are doing web series and getting picked up. Um, there's one that just got picked up by an amazing production company called East of La Brea. It was a project that was produced by Samir Gardezi, who's a longtime screenwriter, and also Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, which was incredibly unique for a Muslim social justice organization to be involved in the production of a piece of art. And of let me see, and, and May, let me add one more uh, to that list because this is some of Amina's work. And uh, Amina has worked on something called the Muslima's Guide to Marriage. I want you to have a little look. Muslima is one of the characters in the film. Have a look. It was the perfect Muslim wedding. You cannot hide this divorce forever, Muslima. Soon as your dies over, Candace is converting to Islam before we get married. As long as I can keep Christmas. Absolutely. <laughs> Ooh, Muslima. Here we go. Salam 5150. Look at Miss Orange is the new black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. sure the whole master knows by now. Thanks. I mean, I'm just wondering, so, do you think times have changed now where you can make a film, direct a film, be, be in the space and change the narrative? Are you changing the narrative? Um, I definitely am. I have a whole team of people behind me mm -hmm. supporting me to do that now. Um, you know, I, I feel like being here, being on this show and seeing all the faces, I want to first say thank you to the panel. You know, I'm happy to see them. Um, because all of us need to do this to change it. I feel like I'm at the beginning of that, but I also think my father, Donald Bakir, who worked on a film, whose mm. book was turned into the film South Central, that had a positive Muslim character, Ali, in um, um, 1992, before Malcolm X came out. I think I stand on those shoulders. Sure. And um, I'm, so I'm ready I, I just, to change it. Salam, I've got, yeah, I, I've got 30 I, seconds left. I, and we're, 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 we're lastly, I'm in the film business, Wait, so you know how long that is. Let me just say this. Oh. I'm, I'm, Developing a TV show. Oh so, my yeah, goodness! We, right. we, we Using that platform—that's what they're doing. Uh, Salam, a sentence. You have a sentence. We need both. We need both advocates and creatives to work on this together. It's like uh, the LGBTQ community sure. uh, works. There's Glad. Impact is like Glad advocating, so and then many. we work with the creatives to promote them as well. All right. Thank let me you. let me let me share this with you. This is from Sahir Ali. Uh, Sahir Ali just sent us this tweet. The most authentic representations of Muslims in popular culture come from those which demonstrate an intimate knowledge of the communities. Intimacy means the storytellers have relationships with closeness and accountability to their subjects. Thank you so much. So much more to talk about. May, Salam, Amina, Azita. We could do another show. We will do another show. We're not a one show uh, topic on this one in particular. Thank you for joining us and I will see you always online on Twitter at AJStream. Thanks for watching.